I'm not sure who did our counting this morning, but I'd recommend they count every Sunday morning. I was sitting back in my usual spot thinking that uh, our numbers were down considerably and counting in my head all of those I knew were away, and yet uh, 198 is a fairly good number of this Labor Day weekend, given the fact that many have uh, been called away. Tim and uh, Nathan Gerber are on their way to Houston as I speak this morning. Uh, Nathan's truck was uh, loaded with all kinds of supplies and generators and things like that, and they were going down to help out uh, Kathy's sister, Chris, so please keep them in your prayers. And Harry mentioned in his prayer this morning, and Kurt will mention again at the close of services, our entire con uh, contribution next Sunday morning uh, will be used for disaster relief in Houston. The money will be forwarded to uh, Churches of Christ Disaster Relief in Nashville. Uh, they get the biggest bang for the buck, and so let me urge you to uh, think about what you could do to help out in that uh, very tragic situation. Already, I am aware that uh, we have uh, $650, and we haven't even taken up a contribution yet, uh, money given in memory of Ron Vanway, Kenny Bourne, Sue Butts, uh, Bob uh, Mosley, and Nell Thompson. And I'm sure that that number is going to increase dramatically uh, by next Sunday. And so dig deep and be generous it is going to a truly worthy cause. Among our visitors this morning, uh, Mari and Isaac are with us. Barb has sent a picture yesterday of Isaac in a basket. I did not know he was in a basket in Marietta, and I was shocked when they walked in this morning. They're looking great. Always happy to see them and uh, glad they're able to be here for the weekend. Uh, there are other visitors as well. We want you to feel as though this can be your home away from home if you're not from the area and worship with us as often as possible. If you grew up in Marietta and this is your first time, uh, we hope that you'll want to come back. It is our goal to exalt God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit as we seek to be more and more like our Master and live our lives so that we have a positive impact on the people around us. We're able to do that because we come to this setting uh, with high regard for this book, the Bible. Bible is from the Greek Biblos, and it literally means book. There are all kinds of books in our world. In fact, there is no end to the making of books, and even Solomon in the long ago acknowledged that. But this book stands out above all the others because it is uniquely God's inspired word. The passage that was read from 2 Timothy chapter 3 highlights the origin of this book. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is literally God-breathed. It came from our Creator. And so it is uniquely qualified to guide our steps and prepare us for eternity. So when we make reference to it, we do so out of our profound respect for our Creator and our Savior. Now, I mentioned to you last week that this month's studies are really designed to come together to help us comprehend the foundations of our faith and go out into our world and face whatever challenges uh, might be leveled against that faith. I told you that in Satan's arsenal, his favorite weapon is a lie. And there are five that he tells with uncanny effectiveness. We addressed the first last Sunday morning, God is dead. God is alive and well. The people who are dying are those that are reflecting on his demise in error and proclaiming that we have advanced so much technologically and intellectually that we don't need God or faith as a crutch anymore. But that's a lie. 
The second lie that he tells and the one we're addressing this morning is that this book is outdated and irrelevant in modern America, in fact, in a highly technological world. After all, the most recent sections, Revelation, were written 2,000 years ago, and the oldest sections go all the way back to Moses 3,600 years ago. How can this book possibly have anything worthwhile to say in our modern culture? And yet this book is a commentary on modern culture. And the fact is very simple. As much as things have changed... People haven't. We still wrestle with the same issues. We still raise the same questions. And the answers, they're eternal because they come from the eternal one. Some things are eternal. Not everything is temporary. And this book is one of those things that is not temporary but eternal. Now, when I say that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, I'm not talking the way modern scholars, academics, theologians talk. They would have us believe that it's inspired only in the sense that it was the product of individuals with uncommon intellect and creativity. I believe that there are some writers of Scripture who had uncommon intellect and were creative, but what they wrote in God's holy book was not theirs, but His. Their words used to communicate His message. So that when we read, for instance, the New Testament and the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, and Jude. We're not really reading what men had to say or what they thought about something. We're reading what God revealed to them to put in permanent form for the ages. So that at any time, men who truly want to know the will of the Master can know it. Others would say, it is not the Word of God, but it contains the Word of God. That's also false. We believe that the Bible from cover to cover is God's holy book and that the message recorded is recorded accurately or correctly as He desired. And though He operated through men, He guided them to present His message as He wanted it proclaimed. If you recall the words of Jesus in John 14, 26, 15, 26, and 16, 13, he made a promise to the twelve. After my departure, I'm going back to the Father. I will pray the Father to send the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, and he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said unto you. Now, that was not a promise to me or you or anyone alive today. It was a promise to those early disciples. And the fulfillment of that promise is found on the pages of the New Testament. So God, through the Spirit, guided them to give an accurate record of His divine will. The Bible's just not one of many holy books. It's the only truly holy book, the only one that comes from the Maker. That is what the Apostle Paul was arguing for in 2 Timothy chapter 3, specifically verses 15 through 17. The Bible simply claims to be God's book and it justifies the claim by the evidence available. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter said that the prophecy came not of old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When you read Genesis through Malachi, Peter is making the same argument for that section of the Bible that Paul made for all of Scripture. It is God's will revealed through God's men by means of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul wrote about things of a spiritual nature. But he said, I do not do it with man's wisdom, but rather with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit teaches so that you can understand His will and know that it is His will and not mine. 
In fact, to the church at Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he commended them because they received the word not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. You can count on what the scriptures say. You follow God's word, and it will never lead you astray. And you ignore it, and you're going to go off on a path that will eventually lead to destruction. There is one way, one truth, one life, and it comes through Jesus, John 14, 26. So the Bible is true. It's true in what it tells. You read this narrative, and what you discover is an accurate record of real people, real events, in a true setting. Adam and Eve were not fictional characters. I'm struck by the fact that many who argue that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are allegory or myth are among the first to admit that they're still looking for our first ancestor, ancient Eve. The reality is, for any of us to be here, there had to be that first pair. And what do you find in Scripture? A record of the origin of man and woman and the institution of marriage. And we really do owe our origin to that first pair. I have never been terribly interested in genealogy. I know my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and of course my dad and mom. And I'm lost until I go back to Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalia, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Those ten souls are in all of our genealogies because every man, woman, and child alive today really have their roots in the narrative of Genesis 1 through 11. The flood was an actual historical event. In spite of the fact there are many who like to make light of that and say it was localized, that's not what the biblical record says, and that record is true in what it tells. You can count on what this book says being accurate. Many charges have been leveled against it, many claims of inaccuracy, but every time more evidence has come to light, the record of Scripture has been exonerated. I have no fear but that that will continue because this is not an ordinary book comes from God. It's true in what it tells. It's true in what it teaches. How can anyone possibly find fault with love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Can you understand for a moment how transformative that is? If every soul on earth today would set out to love God with all their being and to love their neighbor as they love themselves, we wouldn't have the kinds of problems we have in this world. Just those two basic principles are that transformative. And then add to it Matthew 7, 12. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. Or Acts 20, 35, it truly is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And look at the virtues that are held up for imitation in 2 Timothy 1. Faith and all that follows enhances life, makes us better people, our communities better, culture better, life better. God's word works because it's true, not in what it tells alone, but also in what it teaches but it's also true in what it touches. This is a book designed to get man into the presence of God eternally. It is not a math textbook, a science textbook, or an English grammar. It's the Word of God, but it touches on many things. And every time it does, it is truthful. One of the best examples I can cite for you is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, where Isaiah, 
a prophet of God sometime in the 7th century B.C., that's 27, 2800 years ago, spoke of the circle of the earth. How in the world could he have possibly done that apart from the impact of God upon his message? It's not a scientific textbook, but when it touches on science, it is accurate and far in advance of its age. One of the fascinating things to read from my perspective, and you may not agree, is the record of Israel in the wilderness, specifically the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, I grant you, when you read them, you better have gotten a good night's sleep, and you might want a cup of coffee or two, because they can put you to sleep. But if you're alert and you really follow the narrative, there are some things in there that are astounding. Do you realize that apparently Moses and Israel understood microbes and germs long before this highly advanced technological society came to terms with them? And there are sanitary precautions demanded of Israel in the wilderness that are absolutely inexplicable apart from the role of God. And I could go on. I'd like to go on. In fact, we could spend an hour just talking about the way Scripture relates to science and how in every case, when truth is known and facts are borne out, this book is right. It's God's book. And yes, it's true in what it tells, it's true in what it teaches, and it's true in what it touches. Therefore, this book has some unique characteristics that are true to it and to no other book. And yes, I'm aware of Islam, Islam's Quran. There's no comparison. I have read it and it is absolutely nothing in comparison to the Word of God. And I, I would encourage you to read it. And I know if you do, you'll agree. Most of it makes absolutely no sense. And yet it's held up as a holy book comparable to the Word of God. I realize that's not politically correct in our multicultural society, but I could care less. And if people take offended or take offense when I say that the Bible is unique among all books, well, either take offense or get over it because it's still true. And it's time we stop worrying about what people thought about us and just concentrated on what the Bible says and what they ought to think about him who gave this book to us. This book has permanency. There have been all kinds of efforts to destroy it. It's been buried, burned, and banned, and still it's the best seller year after year after year. And I applaud that, but I have to pause and tell you, it may be the best seller, but it's often one of the least read. But the message is there for all of us. In a form that every house, I believe every person in America has access to it. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that anybody in the world who really wanted to know God and know God's word would have access to it. God would make that possible. I see that in Acts chapter 10 in the conversion of Cornelius, a devout, religious, generous, prayerful man who just wanted to be right with God. And guess what? God made sure that that man heard the message of Jesus, the same God that you and I live and serve today. His message, even though there have been all kinds of efforts to destroy it, it's still there. And I have no doubt that it will always be accessible and available. And the scriptures underscore this over and over and over again. Psalm 119, verse 89. The psalmist wrote, I want you to hear his words, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. You see, its source is divine. Its origin is from above. Its message is a permanent message. Isaiah said, the grass withers, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. 
Isaiah 40, verse 8. And Jesus made this proclamation in Matthew chapter 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked the paths of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. 2,000 years ago. And here we are in 2017 still talking about him and his message. I can tell you with absolute certainty if this world stands another 2,000 years, 2,000 years from today, nobody's going to be talking about anything I said. And that's the way it ought to be. My words are not permanent. But his really are. And they, they are the words that matter. They're not just permanent folks. They're relevant. This book has relevancy. One of the reasons why I believe it is among the best-selling and least read is that it is just too relevant. People read, and if they understand, they're going to treat, see their true selves in the pages of this book, and they're not going to like what they see because it calls us to a standard that many are not willing to aim for. But it's still the right standard. This book, to put it in a way I hope you can understand, is living. When I say it's relevant, I say that it's alive in the sense that it speaks to the hearts, to the needs of people in every kind of situation that you can imagine. If you've just been overwhelmed by a flood as folks in Houston have, this is where you want to go. This will remind you that life does not consist in the abundance of the things which we possess. And I've listened to a little of the news for broadcast and heard some of the people that have been interviewed and it brings out the best of people in times like those they're facing there. They say, we're alive, our family's well, we're all safe. Everything can be replaced. How true that is. That's what this book says. Yesterday, I was in Fairmont for my dad's estate sale. I saw my sisters in tears. I had several people wonder, how do you feel? What do you think about all of this? Does it bother you? It's stuff, people. One of the things my dad enjoyed almost till the time he died was going to sales and buying stuff. And I said, Dad, you're just collecting for our sale. Stuff. That's all it is. It doesn't mean anything in the great scheme of things. He died in March and every bit of that stuff stayed. And when they went through the house and the shop and the barn and the garage and the outbuilding, they could not believe all the stuff. And it's just stuff. People matter. Stuff doesn't. That's the message of the Bible. Get your life right with God and keep it there and it will be well with your soul. This is a relevant book for whatever you're facing. You don't have to be going through a flood to come to the realization that people matter, not things. That a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Thank God for the blessings we have in Jesus and for the instruction manual that will get us ultimately into his presence eternally. This is a living book that speaks to the issues of the hour and to the needs of the heart. It is not just living, that's the assertion of Hebrews 4.12, the Bible is alive and powerful. It is life-giving. It is in this book and in the message of this book that you will find real meaning for the day. I talk to people from time to time who tell me they just dread getting up in the morning. I can't wait to get out of bed. I get up a little earlier than my wife most days. But she's retired. I'm not. But I can't imagine not getting up early. Life is just filled with promise and opportunity. And this book tells us how to seize the day and live life fully. 
it really gives us the abundant life that Jesus came to provide. John 10 verse 10. And that's why Peter talks about it being that life-giving mechanism so we can be born anew into the family of God in 1 Peter 1, 20 through 23. It's living, it's life-giving, it's also life-developing. Peter urged his readers to desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. You want to become all that God envisions for you. You've got to spend time in this book. The message is permanent, the message is relevant, and I will submit to you that the message is reliable. You can count on it. You can know that what it says is so. And if you build your life on it, you're building on a foundation that is unshakable. You know, floods have been around a long time, and people have been dealing with them forever. And Jesus addressed this in the Sermon on the Mount. How did he close that sermon? With a story. A story about a wise and a foolish builder. One built on a rock and the other built on sand. And the rains fell and the winds blew and the floodwaters rose and the house on the sand was washed away. But he who built on the rock, that house stood. That's still a vital principle. And I have to tell you, just from a, an aside, that there are times when I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who build on the sand, and when the waters rise and the winds blow and the rains come and their houses are destroyed, you build on the beach, people expect to face that kind of weather. And don't expect me to pay for it when you get it destroyed. Now, the situation in Houston is vastly different. Many of those who were caught up in those floodwaters were told they would never need flood insurance. They'd not gotten water here in over 500 years. These are the same people, by the way, who say that global warming is a real thing or climate change, who told me that yesterday in Fairmont there was a 90% chance that it would rain all day and the sun was beautiful when I got up. These are the people I'm supposed to believe. No, this is what we're supposed to believe, people. This, this is reliable. Weather forecasts are not. The God Almighty is. This book is indestructible. People will try to make light of its message. They will argue with the devil that it's outdated, outmoded, irrelevant but they're never going to win. You see, when you just open it up and you read it and understand it, this message will resonate. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. They will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall be called the children of God. Did you see what happened in Nashville this past week? Mari, you couldn't have missed it. Area preachers came together and essentially said, we stand with Scripture regarding human sexuality, that adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and a host of other sins are sins. And what a fury it caused across our land. How could anybody possibly believe this? Because it is the truth. And for almost all of recorded history, we've understood these things. Suddenly now, in the last 20 years, the world has been turned upside down. And evil is now good and good is now evil. Well, guess what? The world is wrong. This book is indestructible and the time will come when people will again be confronted with the reality that this is God's word, but for many it will be too late. They will try all they can to destroy it, but they never will because this book has a power that can be found nowhere else. Paul said, for as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This book can take a man whose life is filled with sin, overcome with iniquity, down in the gutter as deep as you can go, and lift him up and reclothe him afresh, clean him, and restore him to his rightful place as a son or daughter of God. No other power in the world can do that. Somebody said, do you ever see Jesus turn water to wine? No, I did not. But I have seen him turn drunkards into saints. He can do both. He did the first at a marriage feast in Cain of Galilee. He's doing the second all the time when people will simply go to his word and follow it. Don't let anyone tell you that this book is outdated, irrelevant. That's a lie. This is God's word and there's no more powerful force on the globe today and if you follow it you will be richly blessed and if you don't you'll regret it for eternity we close with Jesus words in John 12 48 he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him the words which I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day that day is coming and we know not when and the only way to be ready is to follow the roadmap God gave us in his holy book that will bring us ultimately into his presence for eternity. Do you believe the message of this wonderful book? Are you ready to obey? We stand ready to help you. Your faith ought to produce repentance, confession, and immersion because this is what the Bible reveals. Whereupon the blood of Christ will wash away your sins. The Lord himself will add you to his church. And he will write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And heaven will be your future. You say, I don't believe any of that. Well, he'll not force you to believe. But if it's true, and it is, and life ends and eternity begins, you will regret it forever. It does not need to be that way. I don't mean to be mean or judgmental or harsh or vindictive. But folks, we better wake up to the truth of God's holy word. And though we will not force anyone to obey it, we will extend the invitation to all. Whosoever will, let him come, even now as together we stand and sing.
Closing song will be number 473. Well, we want to thank Roger for another powerful and excellent message. While I do appreciate how well Roger presents each message and how easily he makes it for us to understand, the power is actually in the words that he presents and the fact that he presents it truthfully. Several mess uh, announcements you need to be aware of. Among the sick, a uh, very short list for a change. Craig Dowler is in the OSU Medical Center, that is Carol Ware's nephew, and he is not doing very well at this time. We do extend our sympathy to the family of Kenneth Williams, that is Diane Wentz's brother. Memorial services were held in Rocky Gap, Virginia. A reminder, as uh, Roger mentioned, uh, co next week's collection, the entire contribution will go to the Church of Christ Disaster Relief for assistance in the Houston area. So keep that in mind as you prepare. For our college students, uh, each fall we list our college students' uh, addresses in the bulletin so people can keep touch with them. So if you have not done so yet, please submit your, your student address to the office as soon as possible. We do have a few upcoming events to be aware of. Uh, there are photography dates this Tuesday and Wednesday, so if you've not yet signed up, uh, there are still opportunities to participate in that. You can see Tracy to uh, find out what times may be available still. Our Widow and Widower's Dinner is coming up September 16th at 5 o'clock. Uh, Sign-up sheets are out in the lobby for, on the bulletin board if you're either planning to attend or would like to help with that. If you have any questions, you can see Kathy Gerber. I uh, invite you back uh, every time we have services. You're always welcome. Uh, next uh, opportunity will be this evening at 6.30 for, for worship, uh, Wednesday evening at 7 for Bible study, and of course next Sunday morning at 9 for Bible study and then followed by worship. Uh, this evening, Roger's message will be in search of truth, and that will be based on John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, if you'd like to read ahead. Uh, following one more song, uh, Todd Haig will lead us in a closing prayer. Number 473, 473, if you're able to please stand. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me.
Let us pray. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we come to you a prayer at the close of this service, praying that everything that we have said and done here today has been pleasing in thy sight. Father, we pray that you will please be with each one of us as we approach the upcoming week. Help us to live our lives in a way that we can be good Christian examples to all those around us. Father, please help us to always realize that not only our words, but our actions put forth the example that you would have us to be. Father, we pray once again that you will be with all those that we've mentioned as being sick. Please also be with those suffering the loss of loved ones. Please comfort them as only you can. We ask that you will please go with each one of us now as we are about to depart. Please keep us safe. Help us to reach our homes and destinations safely. Father, it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.